Well, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are uh, here to talk about, well, we're here to do a, a Q&A session around CITP. Now, um, everyone that's joining today uh, should have already gone through the process of, you know, being involved within our first CITP awareness session. You've joined us for the uh, the in-depth session around what we're looking for, what the assessors are looking for, what the standard is actually asking for you, and that you'll maybe be on that path of applying for CITP now. This session is to answer some questions uh, while you're going through that process. It's, I would say, quite an informal session. Um, you've got myself, uh, I'm Nick Phillips, I'm the standards engagement manager for BCS, so I'm here to support you um, going through the process of your application, so feel free to ask away if you need any additional support after this session. Uh, we've also got Dale Tickham. Um, are you happy to introduce yourself, Dale? Yeah, certainly. Thank you, Nick. And um, yeah, good morning, everyone, and, and welcome. Uh, so I'm I'm Dale. I'm head of IT at BCS, the Chartered Institute for IT, um, but I'm also uh, a CITP assessor. Um, and in, in my assessment capacity, um, I support our, I say our internal BCS team, sort of folk like Nick and, um, and other people who work with our, within our membership area and products and standards and around organisational membership to, I suppose, really have sort of sessions like this. And they used to be, you know, face, face to face and hopefully they, they will be again one day, um, certainly within our organisational membership structure at least. And, um, and I would go along and sort of speak with and discuss with um, with applicants. Yeah, the process of applying and some, you know, sort of tips and tips and tricks. Um, and just very sort of very briefly about me. So I, I lead the IT team here um, at BCS and that's a department of kind of um, operational IT staff plus our application development and support function. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Steve, are you happy to, we've got Steve Newens with us as well. Are you happy to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. So hi there, um, Steve Newens. Um, so I've got quite a long background in IT, about 30 years or so. Um, I started out as an analyst programmer um, working in things, technologies like Oracle, um, then moved through into business intelligence and sort of technical consultancy, um, then into project management, program management, program director level. For the last four and a half years, I've been independent um, and I've actually sort of stepped back from the sort of senior program roles into project delivery because I quite like it. Um, so, so that's my sort of technical background. Um, for about the last four and a half years, I've been an assessor for the BCS. So, so this is a voluntary role as well. So I give up my free time, weekends, evenings, um, working at home. It's a bit easier to give up some of your daytime as well um, to assess applications. And I cover CITP. I also cover the Engineering Council accreditations as well. Um, so as I say, I've been doing that for about four and a half years. I also sit on um, the membership and certification panel and sort of go through things like QA review of the applications. So we have an internal process to make sure that the assessors uh, are doing a good job. And, and I sit on the body that looks at, at the assessments that are made. So uh, that's me. Thank you for that. And then we've also got Russell Friend, who's the Standards Development Manager for BCS Japan to introduce yourself. Absolutely. Good morning, everybody, and uh, thanks for attending. Um, I'm the Standards Development Manager within BCS, so I, I look after the CITP standard. My background is I've got an excess of 20 years in learning, development and education and training. Um, and so hopefully I might be able to offer some help, support and guidance today, but I suspect the assessors will probably be able to give you much more guidance for the matters that you're probably most interested in. <laughs> Thank you for that. Perfect. Really do appreciate that. Uh, let me close that down. Apologies. Um, so one point, as Mr. Russell just mentioned here, is that you do have assessors on this call at this time. So feel free to you know, ask questions away. We're going to be going through a process of the three stages of the application. So looking at you know, what's actually expected from uh, CITP and what that process looks like as in your application form and so on. We'll look at what the assessors are, are looking for. We'll, we'll cover this lightly, what we've already spoken about in the past, and then we'll start going into more around what the interview process is. At any time, we do have a chat function and we can ask, ask questions in that chat. So feel free to you know, get started 
throw your questions out there. Um, but really, it's about you feeding back to us, asking what you, you know you have on your mind, so that we can hopefully answer as many questions as possible. So if you're happy, we'll get started, and uh, we'll just do a quick overview of what we spoke about last time, and we'll stop at each section just so you know give you time to ask some questions if needed. So I'll start with my bet. Let's look at the CITP application. So at this point, you may already be, you know, you might have already gone through the point of application, you might have started your statements, you may be putting together your CV, whichever point you are, this will this will be the process that you'll be going through. It all starts with CITP there being an application. Um, the application covers two sections, um, autonomy, complexity, uh, autonomy, complexity, influence, and um, uh, business skills. With those areas, you'll be filling in a set of statements, 2,000 characters each, and then there's a breadth of knowledge section which covers 3,000 characters. Once you've completed that point, you'll then have to upload that information with a supporter, including uh, an up-to-date CV. We're usually looking for something like a maybe a two to three pager, just a bit of history about previously what you've been up to. So once you've done that, or if you're in the process of doing that, great, you're on the right course for CITP. The next step from that is that we will sort a supporter for you. So that'll be cases you'll provide us with information on who you'd like to support your application. We'll get in contact with them and ask them if the information that you've provided is valid. Um, would they have the opportunity to go through all the statements that you've put forward? And then once that's been successful, it then goes for an initial peer review with assessors such as Dale or maybe Steve. Um, there's usually two assessors, there'll be volunteers and there'll also be uh, CITP as well. So they would have gone through this process, they would have had training around you know, what we're looking for, the depth of the standard and so on and uh, assessment process. And they'll usually have a conversation around the information that you've provided to ascertain if you're at the right level, working to that right level, if there's any additional work that might be needed and so on before you finally go through to an interview process. There's then a point where we contact you, say, hi, fantastic, you've gone through to the interview process, now you need to book a time and a date that's good for you. You'll be there for an online presentation uh, for 10 minutes, and then the rest of that session will be about 15 minutes to an hour, where the two assessors will be interviewing you, going into a little bit more depth about what you do, uh, the history that you've put into your statements, and so on with your CV, just to ask that you really understand more about you and draw out the values and the areas that we're looking for within CITP. Once that's completed, uh, they'll leave you. They won't. They won't tell you if you've been successful or not because they'll be discussing that throughout the next few days, just to make sure that everything is you know, checks and balances. And then you'll be given a, a verdict if you've been successful or not. If you've been successful or not, uh, that you will always be given some sort of feedback, uh, usually around how to develop those skills, what may be needed, and so on. So we always give valuable feedback after as well. Um, I feel like that's really, really the, you know the the mid part where you will probably be in a position where you will be looking at you know what you've provided information around your your cv things like that and if you do need to update that information we'll give we we'll give feedback around that um always quick checklist just to look over you know always focus on areas that you're you know you've been doing your achievements the areas that you focused on the bits of work that you've done we'll go into a little bit more around that in a moment with the assessors but really what we're trying to draw out here from your cv and your your, your statements um, are really about outcomes of what you've done the impact that you have had as an individual and making sure that everything you put together is aligned with the citp standard there is also an accredited qualification route if you're not already aware of that, we did mention it before, but when you're going through this process, if you have any qualifications that are accredited by BCS, you can uh, take a look into our system. There is a link when you apply for our uh, CITP, and that will allow you to check your qualifications, see if there's any areas of the registration, the CITP application that you can bypass. At that point, just so you're aware, you will need to have your CV. Um, usually, we come through the case of going through this process, some people, go through, they put their statements together, it's all great, and then they've forgotten to put their CV together, or maybe it's not up to date, and they feel that maybe that's something later down the line, you need to provide that information with your application, just keep that in mind. So that's really the process behind it. We always give feedback, we're always there to support you through this, so if you've got any questions at this point, feel free to drop it into the chat, I'll pause for a minute, and if you've got any questions, we'll answer them. Quiet so far. Linda, have we got any questions at all? Not at the moment, no, Nick. 
perfect, I'll take that. So in that case, everyone understands the process, perfect. So you should already be at a point where you've been putting your statements together or your CV together and so on, or you're preparing for that interview, whichever state you might be now, the next section will probably be most valuable to you. So what we'll do is we'll move on over to what an assessor is looking for. So we have, of course, we have Dale and Steve who are here to give you a little bit more information. So what I'll do, if you're happy, Dale, Steve, I'll hand over to you. Yeah, thank you, Nick. Um, so yeah, this this I suppose uh, when you if you were with us last time, I think I think everybody everybody was. Um, this is this is a reminder really about those those areas that the standard is is going to assess you uh, against, and that and that people like Steve and myself will um, certainly at that interview stage be um, be asking you some questions to uh, to drill into a little bit further your your written submission um of course will uh will have category each of these categories you will need to um provide us uh information uh, on and for um i think the 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 thing that i would remind um at this stage um i think steve steve and i said it said it last time too is that you yeah, know strong strongly suggest if you are still still writing or in the process of um of iterating your written submission is to is to look at the sophia framework um in in my bcs um so you know really find where your role fits best looking at the background the work activities and the knowledge and skills that are um that are specific to those um areas where where you think your role fits the framework nicely um and, and remember that Sophia is is being assessed at level at level five and above um as well so that's that's important to to remember but looking across the um the framework and looking at these um areas uh, of the standard that that you will be assessed against you know hopefully those will prompt all all manner of examples that you can that you can put into your written submission and that you can that you can think about um having in preparation for your presentation for the interview stage um as well Yeah, I think um, all, all of that is is um, is exactly what I, I would point to as well. So there's a couple of there's a couple of key resources. Um, so there's the CITP standard itself, and that is broken down. So under things like autonomy, there's three criteria under that, and it always helps your application if you can address each of the individual criteria. So please read the standard. It's not very long. Um, so read it, understand it, and then try and um, make your response align to that because it always makes your, you know, makes everybody's life um, easier. Um, the second thing is, as already mentioned, Sophia Plus. So that actually breaks down into your role. So uh, myself, let's say I'm picking today project manager. There is actually a Sophia Level Five project manager. Um, section and it talks about the things that are being looked for um, in a project manager at Sophia level five which is really helpful so that when I'm now trying to fill my application in I've actually got some sort of it, it's given me some reasonable guidance and then all I've got to do is fit my work experience um, against that guidance so that's also very useful um, so both of those should be the sort of thing that you have on your screen whilst you're writing um, final bit really from me is, is is don't copy and paste from your CV. It might sound a bit obvious, but you're already giving us your CV. So we want examples, yes, but what we don't want is you just lifting and shifting words from one to another. So if you are going to do it, look at the guidance and then give us your contribution to something. Um, so slight health warning from my side today is Obviously, my specialism is around projects and program management. I also cover service management. So any examples I give will probably be within that sort of world. Now, if you work in a different world, like technical architecture, security, or any other area, because um, Sophia covers a huge, um, a huge range of topics, um, what I talk about in my examples won't always be directly relevant to you. So don't think that you have to answer everything in the way I say. I'm giving examples based on my specialism. Your specialism might be different and Sophia Plus will help you with that. 
Um, so as I say, take any examples I give with a pinch of salt because it's very much that I'm talking about my specialism and your specialism might be something different. Yeah, and um, and and yeah, one one other addition. Obviously, agreeing with everything um, Steve is saying there, really really useful, helpful um, um, advice is uh, within within this submission as well. Uh, you know, really um, explain as well how your specific role um, sort of fits into into the organisation where where that's relevant to do. So don't assume that you know Steve and I will um, you know be able to understand. The very the very nature of your of your role um, or as Steve was saying you know we we might not share um, the same specialism especially at the first kind of initial um, review of the written you will always have the lead assessor in your interview who does share your specialism um, but certainly for this written where um, any of the, the the pool the panel of assessors might might review um, yeah, de definitely do include appropriate kind of um, explanation of, of the context of, of your role and your role, not not you know not not um, not necessarily everybody else's because this is this is your application, and you know again we've we've said it before previously, but in doing so as well, don't also assume that we necessarily understand um, the industry or the part of the industry that you that you work in. So you know try to be. Um, try to be clear and, and, and try to avoid or if, um, acronyms or explain acronyms if, um, if, if they need to be used. I do have a question from attendees, Nick. Would you like me to ask, ask it now? Yes, feel free. Feel free. Um, so we have a question um, which is around supplying CVs. Can you provide an updated CV nearer the interview phase, i.e. if you've got an achievement you want a reference that was accomplished between assessment stages? Can I answer that one? Go ahead. Sure. Uh, or I'll have a first attempt and, and, and Steve Russell Nick, you can you can follow up and <laughs> correct me or, um, or, or not and agree. Um, there, there isn't the opportunity to um, provide a, a sort of second or an updated CV. The CV uh, kind of goes in at, at the front of the process. Um, however, I would say if between the first part of the assessment, um, you know, your submission of the CV, your written statement, and then your progression to interview, um, you know, if, if you think it is relevant and it's going to support your application, then, then store it, keep it in mind, and within context of um, either the questions that the assessors ask you at the interview you can feed it in then or indeed at the end I think Steve it's fair to say I'm sure I'm sure we do and I'm sure every other assessor does as well because it's part of part of the, the, the good practice of being an assessor and giving the candidates um, the applicants the best opportunity to um, you know do their best throughout that process is at the end typically towards the end as well we will ask whether there is anything else relevant um, to support the application um, that the applicant feels it's it's worth sharing at this stage. So so no, not not the opportunity to provide a second version of the CV several weeks later. But I think ample opportunity during the interview where relevant to to bring that forward. Yeah, that's uh, I, I think that's pretty much on point there, Dale. Um, yeah, just really mentioning around, you know, those areas, if there is any achievements you have, you know, qualifications, even certifications, something that you've done maybe for CPD, areas like that, you know, assessors will ask at the end, uh, is there anything additional to add? Or like as Dale has said, if there's anything that links into that conversation, feel free to mention it. Um, really just kind of echo Dale's point there. I think Nick as well, I was going to say, can I add that? Um, because uh, there have been questions asked about the CV in the past, and I think it's understanding the distinction between your application form and the evidence you present in there and its purpose, and the CV and its purpose. And I think because the CV is, is demonstrates your experience, and then it's your application form that demonstrates your competence. And consequently, with Steve saying don't cut and paste, he's absolutely right because actually they should be presented in slightly different ways. Um, so I think if you understand the distinction between the two, it, I think it makes it easier then to understand what you need to include in them. Um, and also, there are I think we've got tools online to help help you with building your CV as well as part of the tools within MyBCS. So don't be afraid to use those as well. 
I think just on that point, actually, as Russell's mentioned, yes, as a VCS member, you have access to my VCS. Jump onto the VCS website. I'll say VCS a few more times when I go to the top right hand corner. There's an icon of a person. Click onto that and it will take you to the member secure area. Now, within there, as Russell's already mentioned, there's a lot of tools that are available to you, um, you know, self-assessment tools, um, you know, knowledge tools, help you build, develop, support in your career. Uh, as Russ has mentioned, there's a CV builder section there where you can put in, lift in all of the information that you've done, your previous experience, and it will help you and support you in creating quite a, I would say, concise CV. There's also other tools out there as well, such as mentoring that can support you with this as well. But anyway, that's my bit. Um, any other uh, any other points on that? No, I think, I think Dale covered it. That you, you know, in interview, we always ask as the usually the very last question. Is there anything that you want to bring forward that you think we might have missed during the interview? Um, we always ask that question. You you can put any case, by the way. So it might be something that you might not have in your CV. It could be a new project that's recently been delivered. It could be anything. So, you know, if you think that we've missed something, you've always got that opportunity to say it. And that will get recorded as part of the interview outcome as well. Perfect. Is there any other questions? Not at this stage. Thanks, Nick. No problem. Before I continue, actually, um, I, al I always ask the assessors this and I feel bad for doing it, but it's it's nice to talk about the kind of pitfalls that you've come across from uh, applications you've seen or things that may have popped up that are quite regular for you when you may be taking a look at applications that you feel that, you know, those who are going through this process now should really know. Is there anything that you've got or on, you know, in your mind that might have gone, okay, really should have thought of this? Is it something they could have done differently? Is there something that's glaringly missing when they're going through their application process at all? So, so I have I have three. <laughs> um, so I've already mentioned one of them, don't copy from your CV um, because I'll, I'll read your CV. So I don't need to read the same thing twice. So that's, that's pretty obvious. Um, the second one is, so sometimes you get people who just answer the question um, presented in the online form and they don't look at the detail criteria behind it so you get a response which talks about um autonomy but it doesn't actually address the, the individual criteria so 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 please please look at that criteria because it really is important and then the third one is it's not explicitly sort of spoken about in the application but um your your CPD is quite important. So this is your continual professional development. So this is all of the things that you do to keep up to date, be it formal or informal. So it doesn't have to be certification. So like I've got Princeton practitioner, for example, but it doesn't have to be at that sort of formal level. It could be attendance at um, you know, a webinar or you've, you've been through the AWS courses so the amazon web service courses they do a lot of stuff online and you can just go on those and look at them um they will develop your skills so so keep a record of it and if you've got a record give it to us because that's always really useful as well um in terms of establishing your overall uh, level of competence and sometimes i have gone back to people at the initial review and I'll ask them for more information about their, so, so they've said they've got a broad range of skills and I've said that's fine, but give, give me some evidence of how you keep those up to date. Um, and that, that's probably the sort of third area. So, so it's like, don't just copy your CV, don't just read the question and not have looked at the individual criteria that goes behind each of the areas that we're looking at. And if you've got a CPD record or you've got a, a, you know, a list of things, give us the list because that's always really useful. So, that, so those have been three that I'd uh, mention as, as sort of gotchas. Thanks I do have care. a question. I do have a question on that, um, which is around how to record your CPD. Um, is BCS tool um, the best one to use? Um, so that's come through from somebody just now. I can I can answer that if you like. So there are yeah there's there's lots of tools out there that can help you you know uh, maintain CPD and keep it recorded. Um, you know there's a lot of ways that you may personally do it. 
yes, uh, the, the tool that's in my BCS is a good way of doing that. You might have ones that you have already internally within your organization, able to track your, you know, what you've been doing previously or your career history. Um, personally, in some respects, for, for myself, ways I record CPD is I take my CV and I look at my milestones and I record them in a different document. There's lots of ways you can do that and there's a lot of ways you can provide it. But yes, the, the BCS tool for the CPD uh, segment is is actually, I would say, very valuable to the point where I'm now um, putting my information into it and it's really easy to lift as well and export if you want to. Can I? Yeah, um, I, 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 so, sorry, so on my CV, I, I list my sort of professional certifications um, and they're the obvious ones. But the the things that aren't obvious are all the other things that you learn as part of your. So I over the years, you know, in the move into cloud computing, for example, I've picked up quite a bit around cloud and that I'm not certified at anything in cloud. Um, so it won't appear on the CV, but it, it, but there'll be things in there. So I have started so, um, like Nick was saying, I, I've started putting my information into in, into the BCS uh, website as well around CPD because there are things that I do which I don't really consider CPD, like like this what I'm doing today, my volunteering for the BCS. I've never recorded that; it was just something I did. And actually, volunteering is a, is a section in your CPD record. Um, so. It's useful because that gives me some reminders of things that I hadn't really thought about as being uh, CPD. Um, but to be honest, if you supply it, uh, you know, you can supply it as a list. It can be in a spreadsheet. It can be just a bullet point list is equally as valid, um, however you've got it. So when you're writing your application, if you just put it in there, um, you know, and as I say, you could just do it as a bullet pointed list is good enough. Um, it's just, you know, um, I'm not looking again, like all things, we're not looking for chapter and verse. It's just evidence that you might have been through some formal training or you've gained some recognition or accreditation um, or you've set a bunch of webinars and that's how you know about a particular subject. And just um, just really, really briefly to add, add, add to um, what Steve and Nick, Nick said there about um, about CPD. Yes. So, you know, I'll, um, I'll advocate and um, be another voice for the, the BCS tool for, for recording the professional development. Um, exactly like like you, Steve, um, I've been using that for a couple of years now. Um, and absolutely right. There were kind of prompts in there, drop downs, categories for things that actually they they clearly are, um, you know, sort of um, con continuous um, professional development. Um, but I, I'd not, not that I hadn't recognised them, but I hadn't thought to record them in that in that particular way. And like you say, volunteering is a great example. Um, you know, things like being on on um, on judging panels for for you know type certain types of sort of industry or category awards. Um, and personally, um, having sort of started to capture and be prompted by what a CPD activity might be. Um, my record now in the BCS tool specifically, I think is hopefully going to be in quite a good place for next May when I need to do my five year, my own five year revalidation for CITP. I think great, I've got now a kind of, you know, relevant, kind of quite a rich, but still quite basic and simple list of, um, uh, of all of these sort of professional development um, opportunities, um, which, and actually, I think if I hadn't have got into a, a kind of cadence of, of recording them, I don't do it as religiously as I, as I could or should. But I know that there would be um, there would be things I would have otherwise missed that would have actually, you know, have, have been quite good evidence. And related to that, there is a question that's come in, Nick. Um, which is, can candidates refer to internal development programmes that have been developed by their specific organisations, manager development applications, recruitment frameworks and um, the like? Yeah, so I I can already see everyone's nodding. Yes, of course you can. Um, I don't know if Dale or Steve want to input anything else around that. Yeah, I, I um, so had one uh, recently who was a project manager um, and most project managers, you see prints sort of pop up or, or similar. Uh, but this project manager who had a lot of experience didn't have any of that because they work for IBM and they have their own internal um, 
way of training up their project managers. They have their own methodology and that person had been through that and um, they didn't include it. So I, I actually went back to them and said, could you give me more details of, of what that is um, to sort of judge its, um, you know, how much, in, how much training you actually went through. Um, and as it turns out, it's it's pretty much like having a print certification. It's just that you went through that process and they are equally as valid. And in fact, with CPD, we often look for internal things. So as I say, I gave the example with AWS. There's a huge amount of stuff online about Amazon Web Services these days. Um, and a lot of that is self-directed learning and you might do it in the evenings or at the weekends. Um, it's not something you do in the office, but you're building your level of knowledge and competence. They are relevant. So yes, put them in. Um, it does no harm at all. I'll give you another example. So I've been doing a lot in Agile and um, I did um, planning poker. I watched a webinar about, you know, an online course about planning poker. Um, you know, so so, and I recorded that in my CPD as well. Um, so it's not it's not an official thing that I've got. There's no certification around it, but it's relevant to the job that I do, certainly within agile projects. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, anything that, and especially when it's your company, if if a company has a a, a, a training process or regime put that in because they are they can be very valuable actually and they almost have equivalence with um with sort of externally trained bodies particularly in my field in project management i've seen some internal ones where you would equivalence them to say something like prince yeah would uh, com completely agree steve and um yeah i i recall an example um of uh somebody in the so in the sort of um solution development sort of implementation um specialism sort of you know um so in the, the person was uh working in software development and yeah you know they had been through um quite a robust actually kind of internal agile training um program which you know all the kinds of things you were mentioning there you know sprint planning um, planning poker and yeah no no formal certification at the end but actually when when i kind of heard heard a bit more about it and saw a bit more about it when asked for more information it it, it seemed pretty robust to giving that person you know the um the, the skills knowledge and awareness they needed to um to 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 reliably say yes i can i can perform software development in in an agile methodology you know great if i um if i could just add as well i think the important thing about cpd is um your reflection on what you learn because i think the, the value of cpd is is not the fact that you just attended something or did something it's about you reflecting on what you then learn from that and how you apply that and I think if you can do that, it almost doesn't matter what the CPD is. It matters what, how that CPD supported you, um, because that's how you get the most out of it. If you actually understand what, how that did help you. And often, you know, there will be things that people can attend and you come away and, and you just attended. Um, so, for example, seminars are great. You can turn up to a seminar or a conference and you can sit and be a part of an audience and come away and gain nothing or you can choose to come away and reflect on that conference and what did it give you what did you learn how did it help you with your development and i think that reflective practitioner is the really important thing when it comes to cpd yeah i'd also add you know if there is something that you've come across in the past or a situation that you may have had to overcome where there's been a lot of problems and you've overcome it in some way what have you learned from it what would you do differently next time these are all forms of cpd as well any other questions not on that, Nick. There were a few um, around what constitutes relevant CPD. You've answered the, them really well. Thanks, panel. Can I Great. just go back to a couple of questions ago, just to elaborate um, uh, on, on something Steve said, and it's relevant, I think, specifically to the slide on the, on the screen at the moment. Um, so I kind of sometimes see that the breadth of knowledge can uh, kind of throw throw some some people some applicants and just really to pick up on something steve said about you know the individual criteria and specifically thinking about um breadth of knowledge the um the application guidance sort of four page 
PDF on on our on our website, which you know I'm sure we can get the links out to um, the exact link for for folk to to come and check back on pages three and four. It's only halfway down page three, and then all of page four does have um, you know the, the 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 links to to what the standard is looking for around breadth of knowledge. It it doesn't have direct examples, but it asks lots of questions, which are um, you know, provoking you to think about examples relevant to to your role, the job that you're doing, jobs that you've done previously before. So of course, this is a bit of a bit of a retrospective as well, because no doubt you've picked up a breadth of of um, of knowledge um, by by not just the role that you're performing now, but possibly you know, very likely, definitely earlier roles that you've performed as well, and and different teams and different specialisms that you've interfaced with. So. I know, or I think I know, just from kind of some some kind of anecdotal experience and uh, a few initial reviews performed, that um, you know some people can can get um, perhaps a little bit thrown by you know what 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 do you mean you know the, the breadth of my my knowledge you know I've not done network engineering I've not done software testing I've not done software development I'm not a project manager no but the words. I think, you know, they're certainly designed to be helpful. The words on pages three and four of that short guidance PDF about what the standard is looking for, I think is a great source of um, getting you to think laterally about um, your, your experience in the round. Yeah, I, th I think I'll back that up in the, in the sense that, so, with, with breadth of knowledge, what we're not looking for is your awareness of absolutely every other single piece of IT. That, that's not what, what we're after. Um, and I think where some people struggle is, is, so you have a specialism, I have a specialism, um, but I'm aware of other things which affect my work. And it's about a lot of the breadth of knowledge sort of fits around those sorts of areas. So it's like, what's your awareness of your industry. So I, I do work in various industries. I, again, I've specialised, so within my specialism, I've specialised. So I tend to do like sort of government type work, you know, which is different to say commercial project management. And there are project managers who build bridges and I certainly don't build bridges. I build software and, and that sort of thing. So, um, but I have an awareness of the industries that I work in and some of the constraints in those industries. So if, if I'm in government, you know, security tends to come to the fore. Privacy is usually quite important. Your ethical behavior is quite important. Um, so those are the sort of things that fit into breadth of knowledge. And, and you're not always aware that you know these things until you think about it. So that's my other thing is, is sometimes when you look through these things, you, you can go a little bit, um, you can go a little bit word blind when you read them because you think, I don't know anything about that. But actually you do. You know more about the businesses that you work within than you think you do. And so it's really just sort of taking that step backwards and just thinking about, you know, what, what do I know about the company that I work for and the business that they operate in, which might actually change or impact the way that I do my work. And that's the sort of thing um, we're trying to get to. Um, it's not having an awareness of sort of every other bit of IT that exists. Obviously, somebody like myself who's at a, you know, been around for a while, I've seen lots of things, but you know, IT comes and goes and technologies change. So I don't know everything. And so, you know, I have a good breadth of knowledge just because I've been on the planet a lot, lot longer than some people. But it doesn't actually mean um, again, you know, I might move into a new industry where I've never worked before. And you have to learn things and you have to learn about the culture of the organization and the constraints that are placed on it. So it's things like that where you, you're sometimes not aware that ha of how much you know. So read the criteria very carefully um, and think about how much you know about your organization, how it works, some of the outside influences that affect the way you work, um, because they tend to help build uh, build your answers um, and as I say it can seem quite different daunting when you first look at it and I know a lot of people do struggle on more on the breadth of knowledge funnily enough than, than the main section because they're pretty clear about what they do in their day job 
but they don't all they're not always as clear about the other things that affect how they do their job so um have, have a sort of think about that and sometimes it's worth i think nick on the previous uh, webinar you sort of said take two or three days to write this and sometimes it's good to just sort of if you if you've got stuck step away um and come back to it later that's what i do um so you know that's the other thing to do and uh yeah so so you know it is one of those areas that can sometimes look a bit more difficult than it really is but we're really just looking for your sort of wider understanding of the business that you operate in and the areas that you've worked in that's what we're really trying to find out thank you um you've actually you've answered the question that i was going to ask before i even was um able to ask it so no that's that's perfect have we got any questions at all there are none that have come through currently no problem thank you good so we've we've just covered you know what an assessors you know what our assessors are looking for really we've covered the autonomy complexity influence business skills you know that first section and we've also talked a little bit around breadth of knowledge has anyone got any questions specifically around these areas is there anything that's kind of burning in your mind that you may think hang on a minute actually i do need to support on this uh, a bit of advice on it feel free to ask away um in the meantime while we wait for those is there anything else for our assessors russell to add to this at all i feel like we've covered an awful lot already actually Okay. Yeah, I, th I think the, the one thing we probably haven't spoken about is is obviously when you go to, if you get to interview, you have to give a presentation. Um, and again, I'll just reiterate one thing about that, which is when you're doing the presentation, um, it, it, the focus should be about your contribution, not about what the thing is that was um, that was built, for example. So again, I'm going back to sort of projects and programs type world. Um, you know, don't focus on what we did focus on what you did so that that would be my only other thing that we've sort of not really mentioned yeah and um and, and practice your your short presentation um as well you know practice it for content practice it for for timing um it 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 helped me to do that personally i remember when i was when i was applying um uh, and, and again, a bit like a bit like the written submission, although although perhaps not quite not quite over such a such a kind of um, length of time. But you know, th probably on my own, I did I did two or three iterations of the of the presentation to to you know to get the um, to get the artifacts on the slides good enough uh, to prompt me to say the right things in 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 my own interview. And I know we said this in the in the last webinar as well, but you know don't don't fill slides with aerial point point eight words after words after words you know we're obviously as assessors we 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 can all read um but we want to we want this to be as much the prompt into you know a further conversation rather than um you know a, a list of, of facts and figures um that 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 we we want to see you talk about the um you know talk us through the presentation as well so so actually i think steve you might have said this last time but um you know actually let less can be more you know tell us um tell us through through conversation through um through presentation um uh, what it is you're you're presenting to us so yeah don't don't necessarily feel that you have to put it all there in great detail one because if you do um, I think you're going to struggle on 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 the 10 minutes timing, and you know that will be curtailed if you're if you're running to time. Um, and 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 secondly, you know we want we want to hear you talk about it because you know that's that's actually you know that's part of the assessment too. You know your ability to verbally, professionally describe something that um, the the two other people in this case assessors in the room um, might know something or nothing about. Yeah, I would uh, probably say the same. One thing I would probably add to this, actually, with uh, talking about that presentation and talking about practicing it, it's uh, a bit of advice I've had from those who've gone through it is practice it in front of people that may not know what you're talking about and practice it maybe in front of people that do and get a bit of a feedback from it. Um, what I found is just from feedback from those who've done that is that they've got a good understanding of time spent you know, talking about it, 
you know, what do they need to cover and maybe interesting points that they may not have thought about that they want to cover as well when you're talking about it. And also, really, this is a 10 minute, this is a 10 minute presentation. Um, yeah, less is more possibly. If you can cover a, a slide a minute in 10 minutes, fantastic, good for you. But what we've usually seen is is, is many, many less slides than that. Um, I've come across some that have done, I, I think maybe a two pager, a two slides. I've seen some that have done a few more, but it's really about what you're talking about, where you know the those that presentation, those slides are there to you know guide you and have points of topic, but really it's about what you can deliver to that presentation that's really important. So practicing it with others is is I would say highly valuable. Yeah. And if your slide deck is on the larger side in terms of quantity of slides, you know, um, maybe as a rough rule of thumb, you know, if it's more than maybe sort of six or eight slides, I think you are really going to struggle within those within those 10 minutes. I've certainly had experiences myself assessing where um, I've known there are more slides left and you know, you've given you've given the um, sort of candidate um, being assessed a sort of two or three minute warning for okay this is you know you know just very briefly this is how much time we have left and you know that they've got five or six slides and and you know it doesn't it doesn't um it doesn't predict the outcome if if you know if it is curtailed but i have seen you know um uh, one or two candidates will get quite flustered because they know they've still got six slides to show us in two minutes whereas actually if that was a if that was a, a different way of presenting us the information it perhaps just could have been half the amount of slides and and that panic wouldn't have been put on themselves because because they've only got halfway through the deck absolutely i think also if, if, if uh yeah i'd like to to add and i think well that's really good advice but I, and the practice thing is so important because actually what you'll find is if people aren't practiced with their slides you can tell because they follow their slide deck People that are well practiced, the slide deck follows them, so that you you know what you're going to say without having to wait for your next slide to come up because you know so well what you're doing. And the other thing is, is we all get really nervous when we present, and what happens when you get nervous is you speed up and you speak really quickly. Now, and and ten minutes will feel feel like a long time to you now, but when you do the presentation, ten minutes will be gone in no time it goes really quickly so i think that practice will help you relax with your presentation it'll help you maybe become a bit aware of, aware of your breathing because your test, chest tightens when you're nervous your breathing changes so it's helping to overcome those things um, will make the presentation actually feel more comfortable for you at the time because for some people who are, there are some people that are very happy to present there are some people that it really is an unnerving thing to do so the more you practice the more you understand and feel your breathing the more you know that the slide deck is following you you're not following it the more that will help you relax those nerves you will have nerves and nerves are good they're not you know they're always good to have but that will help you control them also give you give yourself the best chance as well you know if there, if there are things that you um that you really want to say and really don't want to forget to say well you know why not stick post-it notes you know all around all around your desk at the time with the key the key things that you really want to get across that you think well you know um i don't want to forget that well stick it stick it in your eye line why you know why why not um it, yeah. it, it will help you and i think that will help yeah to some of the points you're making there russ as well i think that might help you feel relaxed and, and sort of in control and, and at ease as well i think the key is as well is is we, we're there to help we're not there to to you know trip trip you up and try and find gaps and things and, and sort of exploit them our job is to help you so so we want you to do the best job possible and we want to um, help you showcase your skills at the best level because actually we want you to be CITP members. When we're, we're not here to stop people, we're actually here to 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 help people and encourage them. So what what you'll find as well is is you know um, we rarely through my experience you know you rarely turn people down. 100% it's usually so we might go back to people and ask them more but it is very rare to turn people down um, unless there's something like they're clearly not working at the right level um, and that's something that Sophia Plus 
helps you with to sort of tie back to that. But as I say, by the time you've got to the sort of into you know the the, the interview stage, you you've been through all of that. So so um, your job really is to just really showcase your skills and 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 show your best side. And we're here to sort of help you. And we'll 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 drill into some detail, you know. And there are certain areas um, that you know you'll have an assessor there who's got the same skill base as you, the same specialism. So they'll drill into things like that. Um, if you're somebody where uh, you know I might be along as a second assessor, and I'm not an expert in your area, um, I'll ask more generic questions. But I actually do quite enjoy um, the presentations myself because that actually, for me, stimulates a lot of questions. I tend to get quite interested and enthused in what you present um, often. So you'll probably find me asking lots of questions afterwards and it's not me trying to trip you up. It's actually because I've actually got quite interested in what you've told me and I, I get quite enthusiastic about it and want to learn more about what you've done. Um, so, you know, um, these processes tend to be quite engaging they're not there you know you don't just see sort of two stone-faced people at the other end um who who sort of are marking sort of bits of paper you actually it does turn into a conversation and as i say i i tend to get quite enthused about these things and i quite enjoy them myself um so and we try and make it an enjoyable process and not something that's uh, onerous so don't get too um try not to be too nervous um, you'll find you relax into it as we go through the process. You'll get more relaxed because we'll start to talk about things that you're familiar with, work that you've done, and it will be very much focused on your skills. So we're not there really to talk about, you know, projects and what's been built and things like that. We're there to talk about what you did. So um, and people tend to find that a little bit easier because obviously, you know, you know what work you've done. And so you're able to talk about it in a more relaxed way. But, you know, don't. Um, don't overthink it is my thing is is you know think about what you want to talk about think about what outcomes you're trying to present and then um and then just do it and then out of that will flow some natural conversation from the from the assessors um who've got experience of doing this i.e the assessment process We've also got experience of your industry. We've got experience of the sort of wider aspects of the work that you do. So we'll bring all of that together and actually it builds into quite an engaging conversation. That's what I've found when I've done these. Yeah, com completely agree, Steve. And, you know, just for the avoidance of doubt as well, um, an assessor is not going to ask you um, technical questions to validate your understanding of, 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 of certain technical um, aspects. You know, for example, somebody like me is not going to sit there and ask somebody um, sort of around around the software sort of development areas of specialism um, to talk about how they would do X, Y or Z in programming language A, B or C or, or you know, what, what framework they would choose to write this front end in. There's there, there is none of that. Sharing the specialism is about understanding your context and being able to, to have a conversation with you to elicit um, as many examples as possible for, for you and the, for, for the assessor to be comfortable you're operating at the level um, of detail that the standard needs you to be and for you to be comfortable to have a conversation with that with that person. But, you know, by, by no means um, is, is any element of the interview a kind of technical oral exam. Yeah. Because if it Sorry. was, I'd be the wrong person to deliver it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you all for that. Appreciate it. Um, really good. I would say really good points here. I know we're running kind of to a close at the moment. So if we do, we have any questions around that at all? No, I think the in, the insight and the guidance there was fantastic. There are there are no questions currently. Perfect. So as we've got a few more minutes, if you do have any questions, feel free to just drop them on and ask us anything um, CITP related. Um, what I would like to do, though, is we do have the chat function and we do have the questions function. Um, here's the question for you. Answer to us. What stage are you at within your CITP application? Is this for you? Are you going through this process at the moment? Um, you know, Tell us what kind of stage you're at or if this is something that you're going to be pursuing. And maybe what you need from us um, as we've got a few more minutes. Um, 
but really i feel like we've covered we've covered a lot of this information um you know already in our previous session that is a recorded uh a session that's available on youtube now as well. well we'll link to that as well um i feel like what we've got here at the moment is 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 probably a good point to stop unless we have any additional questions but you know this process is there to you know support you to go through um, and hopefully be able to you know go through the process of actually finally applying for CITP, being able to you know get that, that get to that point of submission. Um, so feel free to sh you know share your insights, and we will be sharing a uh, survey after the session as well, just to get your thoughts and feelings, and maybe some additional support that you may require as well. I don't know if anyone else has anything else to add. No, I, I, I don't think I don't think so, Nick. No, happy happy that we've had a kind of you know broad covering conversation there, and I and I hope it's been helpful to um to our people watching and listening today. Yeah, I agree. Uh, uh, the only thing I would add is um please do look at the tools within your as a BCS member, you've got your access to my BCS. To, please do look at the tools that you get available there, and because you may find some of them will help you as well through the process, particularly that CV um, builder tool. Absolutely. Great. Well, I have I'm... one question just Go coming ahead. in, Nick, um, from somebody who's currently writing the application form, hope to complete it in the next few weeks. Oh, it's not a question. It, it's um, it's a comment, which is lovely. Really helpful <laughs> session. Thank you for the insights. Thank you very much. Very much appreciate that. Okay, well, I think I think we're good here. Like I said, there'll be a survey that'll be sent out after the session. Uh, we will also send out a pack of all the previous information that we've covered. Um, I'm more than happy if you would like to get in contact with myself and talk a little bit more about the application, maybe I'll put you in contact with mentors or, or assessors who may be able to support you with your application. Feel free to get in contact with me. I'm happy to go through that with you. Um, on that note, I think we're good. Thank you so much to you know Dale, Steve, Russ, and also, um, our marketing team who are there supporting us with questions really do appreciate and hopefully you've you found this uh, supportive um let us know what we can do to support you even more if needed and um i guess we'll say goodbye thank you thanks everyone yeah thanks, thanks.